the Word of God, which is the foundation for living. From Westminster Presbyterian Church, 20 6th Avenue Southwest, with Reverend Joseph Reed. And now, following these announcements, Reverend Reed. Good morning. I'm Eugenia Henry, a member of the Westminster Presbyterian Church family. Thank you for tuning in today to hear God's Word. Please continue to join us each Sunday morning from 1015 until 1030 here on WATV 900 AM. And now, here are today's announcements. Our Sunday school begins at 9.30 each Sunday morning. Join us for a lively discussion. Mrs. Bonetta Wyatt is our superintendent. Our weekly Bible study class meets each Monday at 5.30 p.m. and is led by our pastor, the Reverend Joseph Reed. Please know, you are always welcome to worship with us each Sunday. Our service begins promptly at 11 a.m. and ends at approximately 12 noon. Following a musical selection, the Reverend Reed will present today's sermon. Thank you. 
Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for allowing us to know who you are in us and who we can be in you. Amen. Amen. A little girl was, a little girl asked her mother, how did the human race appear? The mother answered, God made Adam and Eve and they had children and that's how humankind was made. Two days later, the girl asked her father the same question. The father answered, many years ago there were monkeys and from which the human race evolved. The confused girl returned to her mother and said, Mom, you told me the human race was created by God and Dad said, we developed from monkeys. Well, the mother answered, well, dear, it's very simple. I told you about my side of the family, and your father told you about his. <laughs> Even in our own family, life can be presented in a contradictory way, especially as we listen to our Old Testament. Father against son, mother against daughter, Confusion in your own household? What a confusing scripture. And then Jesus followed the same scripture with the same words in the New Testament. Please join me as I speak to you briefly on the subject, paradox of wisdom. Paradox of wisdom. What's a paradox? A paradox is an argument that produces an inconsistency. Paradoxes are known to be invalid arguments. My lawyer friend knows what I'm talking about. But still causes us to see something in a different way. Like parables, Jesus' statements are designed for the heart. Listen to me carefully not the head. He gave us something to pray and meditate upon, not to think about. And that's hard for us Presbyterians to comprehend. Not thinking? His words represent some of the great paradoxes of life. The problem is we read and hear Jesus but do not understand his meaning. And unless we do understand, we will not understand his message. And we may miss his plan for our salvation. Here's the message. The peace that brings the wisdom of God requires us to do two things. One, move beyond our head to our heart. And two, change when we hear the truth. Move and change are our key words. Jesus says in Matthew 10, 34, do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. What? Jesus? Not bringing peace? The star that stood over his stable was about peace. Jesus is all about peace. What do you mean, Jesus, when you say, I didn't come to bring peace? Then he goes on to say something even more paradoxical. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. You ever heard the saying that the truth sometimes cuts? <laughs> like a sword. That's what Jesus is talking about. These are paradoxical words. They mean as long as we are on earth and interface with other human beings, there's going to be conflict. Put two people together, there is what? Conflict. 
I don't care if you've been married forever. You're going to argue what? Sometimes. I don't know what kind of marriage that is when you don't argue sometimes. You're going to have this or what? Agreement. Since the beginning of time, there have been wars and rumors of wars. There's been conflict. There's been battles. There's been differences. And believe it or not, most wars are fought over religion. Isn't that sad to say? Killing in the name of the Lord. Jihad. That word should be in our lexicon by now. Those of us who track with terrorism and all the acts of terrorism, those who commit those acts claim that it's God ordained. That somehow killing innocent human beings is something that's ordained by God. Conflict. Well, you know, the only way for there to be truly peace on earth is if, listen to me carefully, if everybody is dead. You ever heard the saying that two can keep a secret if one of them's dead? <laughs> as long as there are human beings on the planet, there's going to be fighting. And the only way for there to be peace is if everybody's gone. Well, that's not the peace I want. There's another type of peace. This peace exists when we are vital. This peace exists when we are alive. This peace is centered in our being. When we come to know who we are in God and who God is in us, there is a peace that transcends our understanding. And people who we were never able to get along with. We can call our friend. But we got to be changed first. This peace occurs when the flame of eternal life is lit and we are no longer in darkness. Then there will be more life. Then there will be more silence. But the silence will belong to eternal life, not to the graveyard. The problem is many of us who claim to be Christians are not prepared to do the work necessary to move from our heads to our hearts. We really don't want to change. We are not willing to turn the temperature up in our life enough to experience the change that results from internal struggle and conflict that comes from finding out who we are. Some of us would rather just go along to get along. <clears throat> Unless we turn that temperature up inside, though, if we keep doing the same thing we're doing, we'll keep getting the same things that we're getting. We want the peace of God without changing from the person we think we are and who we present ourselves to others to be. Here is the paradox. We see Jesus as the author of peace on earth, but his real goal is to change us from within with his sword of the word, with his sword of righteousness, with his sword of truth. But we don't come to find out. We won't come to a Bible class or a Bible study. We won't get here for a Sunday school lesson. We don't have our Bibles laid out at home where we're doing deep, serious study of God's word because if we were, we would know the truth and the truth would what? Would set us free. And this is the sword that Jesus is talking about. And his sword or word is the only way to the peace that transcends understanding. There are two ways of obtaining this peace. First, we must learn how to move beyond our heads to our hearts. This is what Jesus meant when he said, do not suppose I have come to bring peace on earth. He was not talking about bringing peace to the mind. Concentrating, contemplating, and meditating on spiritual matters will drive the mind crazy. You ought to try it sometimes. 
Try just being quiet without thinking for five seconds. I am sure a thousand things went through your mind. <laughs> and it had nothing to do with worship. <laughs> Only accepting the Lord in our hearts, not in our mind, would lead to peace within. When we accepted Jesus Christ in our life, we did not realize that we would be changed forever. We came for peace, but as we are, we cannot find peace in our thoughts nor in the physical actions we make in the world. It is impossible to be at peace unless we connect the heart to the mind. That's what love is, isn't it? You ever tried to love somebody with your mind? Don't work too well. They just don't do right, do they? <laughs> they just don't do what you want them to do. But when you love someone with your heart, you can overlook a multitude of sin. And sometimes that's the only way some of us can truly what? Love one another. Two. To have the peace that God gives, we must be willing to change after we hear and know the wisdom of God. When God cuts you, when Jesus cuts you, you don't bleed. But you've got to either change or get out of the way. This is the paradox of wisdom. To have God's presence, we need to become who God intended us to be. Scripture says, be ye transformed by a what? Renewing of your mind. Not only does transformation require renewing of the mind, but a changing of our own spirit. We call it being what? Born. Saved. Somebody said born again. All those things. That's right. That's what we call it. Somebody with me. Say Amen. I don't mean external change. I don't mean renovation. You know, some of us do a lot of renovation. I don't mean rehabilitation. Some of us do a lot of rehab to suit ourselves. I don't mean an extension of that old person that we used to be. Some of us like to add on. You know, like you add on to your house. Well, God says you can't add on to this. You got to do a 300 and what? 60 degree turn. That's what repentance means. Somebody said, all right. All right. Amen. <laughs> repentance means to what? To turn right. around. That's what it means. It also means to return. Oh, yeah. To return to God. That's what we're talking about here. We call it repentance. We call it turning around. And the only way to stop a train and turn a train around is to stop the train and turn around. It adds up to this. We must move from our head to our hearts and allow God to use that sword on us to do some surgery, to remove that part that's holding us back from his love his grace, and his mercy. This sword is the paradox, but the truth of Jesus Christ is everlasting. Let us pray. God, open us up with your sword of truth and to bring us your peace today. Amen. You have been listening to the Word of God, which is the foundation for living from the Westminster Presbyterian Church, 20 6th Avenue Southwest, with Reverend Joseph Reed. And now until next time, let the church say, Amen.